Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Kane Sims here from VUX World. Getting a lot quicker at putting this link from here into that LinkedIn invite. Uh, it's it's definitely happening quicker than it used to. Welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Kane Sims, your host of VUX World, the podcast where we dive deep into the world of voice and conversational AI. We find the industry's leading minds and leading experts, pick their brains about how they do what they do so that you can do what you do better. Whether you're working on voice assistants, chatbots, any kind of speech or NLP driven AI initiatives, this is the podcast that will guide you and make sure that you are doing the right thing properly. Uh, shout out to our sponsors, Deepgram, who are sponsoring this episode of VUX World. Deepgram are a speech recognition technology. Whether you're looking to use uh, speech recognition, automatic speech recognition for transcripts, whether you're looking to use it for voice bots, whether you're looking to use it for absolutely anything that needs to be taking speech, turn it into text, and then feed it through things like an NLU check out deep ground they've got immense accuracy over 90 percent in some cases extreme value for money in comparison to all of the other providers out there and if you are seriously looking for something then i'm sure they will do a benchmark between them and other providers as well and help guide you in the right direction so if you are interested in checking out more head to deepgram.com forward slash vux world that is deepgram.com forward slash vux world okay now on with the show, our guest today is Dr. Jason Mars. And uh, firstly, anyway, I think I'm just going to bring you up, Jason. Welcome, Jason. Hey, Hello. how's it going? <laughs> really good. <laughs> thank, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. I was just about to reel through all of your credentials because you're an author of Breaking Bots, the co-founder of Clink. You're a Forbes published author, 40 under 40, voted fourth in the top 11 technologists from presumably uh, VoiceBot. Uh, recognized as one of the top most innovative CEOs in banking. You ha you're a professor at the University of Michigan. You're, you're founder of, now of Zero Shop Bot. It's like, where do you get time to sleep? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, it, it's crazy, you know. Um, yeah, I, ever since I started my career, you know, right out of college, I, I was very focused and keen on doing something big, right? Uh, I, I'm a tinkerer. I've always tinkered and built interesting things and, um, you know, very creative, did a lot of music and, um, you know, I just have this, my joy comes from creating things and watching it create benefit in the world, right? So if, if there's something that, if there's a problem that needs to be solved or there's a challenge uh, that requires technology, you know, the prospect of being able to make a contribution to build something interesting and then, and then watch that thing live a life of its own it has driven me and you know being able to kind of apply my energies on that is what wakes me up in the morning so um i you know uh yeah <laughs> thanks though that was an awesome introduction <laughs> but but you know. but you could you could do that you can do that kind of with a lot of technologies, you can make an impact in the world. You can make useful stuff. You can provide value yeah. to people, yeah, and you can yeah. do that in many, many different ways. Why, why speech technology and why conversational yeah. AI in particular? Yeah, yeah well, you know, I, I, I see conversational AI and AI in general really as a holy grail problem in society and in our world uh, when it comes to the next step for technology. Um, you know, throughout my uh, research career, my academic career, and you know. In the engineering sciences, you're solving problems, inventing solutions, and so forth. You know, I, I touched on many interesting challenges that faced society, but the one that was most compelling, the one that um, really calls for us to innovate in a large scale, are those related uh, to artificial intelligence and how our society and all of our technologies are imbuing uh, AI into the way we solve problems and improve the quality, our quality of life. And, and I actually believe that fundamentally human beings, when we think of intelligence, we, we think about it through conversational means. Before there was electricity and computers, uh, intelligence was going across the street and asking your neighbor who was an expert at, I don't know, uh, you know, a car to, to help you figure out what's wrong with your car. Uh, and, you know, to ask someone questions about the world and, and have them tell you. And so there's a conversational, they'd be biologically uh, evolved to use conversational means to access intelligence fundamentally. And, uh, and you know, when you look at where we are in the world with these types of technologies that uh, bring that conversational capability to computers or 
um, uh, you know, to software or tech, um, it's just way archaic. It, it feels like we're in a weird prehistoric <laughs> time when it comes to the sophistication of these conversational AI. And I think we can do a lot better given, given the science, given what's possible with machine learning models today. And so uh, I spent a lot of time working in that natural language processing well when it comes to new AI solutions and uh, toward conversational AI that actually seems intelligent, that actually uh, uh, you would want to interact with like you interact with another human. Mm. And it's interesting that because before you're right, before technology, even business and everything was done through conversation, wasn't it? Going down to the market and taking your goats or your sheep or whatever, and then haggling with the other person and exchanging a few chickens or whatever it might have been. It's all it was all part of conversation, wasn't it? And yeah. ultimately, most of the things that we do are in some way conversational even if you click yeah. a button on a website there's still an intent there and an action that's responsible there's a reciprocation right. at, at the very least right. <clears throat> and then you've got you know i'm sure you've seen you've read wired for speech and, and those kind of books that, mm. that kind of get into the the nature mm. of, of language itself and there's a lot of mm. stuff around i think steve pinker the stuff mm. of thought i think it is and he mm. talks about how you can't really have a thought without mm. first making that thought it. it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, articulate in, into language in, in your brain. Yeah. So it's yeah. uh, apart from instinctive, like jumping out the way of a car, but if you're actually consciously thinking about something, you yeah. think in language. Yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. is it the, is it, do you think that it's the ultimate interface? Is that where yeah. we're going? Or do you think there's a step beyond that, which is implants in brain? Right. Kind of I, I think it's really fascinating uh, that you raise this concept of um, language is 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 fundamental at least in human beings to the development of intelligence right i mean if you were to um remove that it's it's almost like the the, the quicker we 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 make our language skills more sophisticated as after we're born the more words we hear as a child the better the better education we get in formulating uh sentences um it's correlated to uh, intelligence down down the line as you as you age, right? So if you if you if you take children and you uh, you you put them in a situation where they do not have stimuli, right? So there's actually a lot of research on this, right? There's really really horrific um, situations where children were like put in a corner when they were kids and they didn't get a lot of access to uh, human or interactions with environments and it. Research shows that if a child is subjected to this kind of um, neglect, this style of neglect, where they're they're kind of put in a chair, you know, one of those feeding chairs for children, <laughs> uh, high chairs, and they're in a corner all day, that fundamentally their their intelligence is in you know impacted forever, right? Mm. And so, so I think you're absolutely right on that point that if you can't if you can't articulate things using language in some form, and it doesn't have to be a particular language, and it doesn't have to be mm. a particular type of expression, but the ability to uh, construct expressions is, is what gives us the capacity to think and, and, and the capability of thinking. That's very interesting. Um, so, I, so I like that you raised that, but um, that is the ultimate interface, right? That we, when, when the world, everything is a, and this may be a bombastic, magniloquent way to frame it, <laughs> But everything, every interface we utilize today is a perversion of what we've, what we've biologically uh, designed to use to interact with other intelligences. So when we use a mouse and keyboard, that's a hack. You know, when we use a touch screen, that's a hack, actually. Because you don't have to, when I'm talking to a, a very smart buddy to learn something, I don't have to plug in something and <laughs> clack or I don't have to touch their face or something <laughs> to interact. You just use words. So everything is a, is a uh, you know, we're very, our ingenuity is, is amazing. So we were able to develop these other means of interacting with systems and tech, but, but it's a perversion and it's, it's necessary. It's necessary because we don't have today the ability to imbue technology and machines with the, intelligence to interact back with us mm. like we do, right? Uh, and the, the recent advancements in, in the science for this stuff 
is getting on to the to use similar mechanisms for intelligence that we use traditionally uh, nlp and computer the computer science area of natural language processing has been based on computational linguistics heavily right so they would create algorithms to take advantage of the formal structures in language to try to encode the capacity for our machines to interact mm -hmm. using natural language and that that was a that's a journey that did not arrive at a truly natural uh, realistic intelligence and so recently with the the disruption that has happened in the academic sphere and this disruption happened now it's like old news it was probably a decade ago that we had some of the first machine learning uh, neural network based language models right it started with word to vec very brilliant language model but but now that we're applying neural networks which is how our brains figured out how to interact we're starting to see another uh, burst of innovation, another burst of capability and capacity. And recently with a certain kind of neural network model called transformer models, transformer models has created, you know, a storm in the, in the science for how we do NLP. And, and these are more familiar to folks as BERT or GPT. Uh, this is what GPT-3 is, is based on, the, mm -hmm. the popular GPT-3. It's, it's a transformer based uh, language model. Right. And so, Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So now's the time. Now's the time that we can do better, but you don't see a lot of better in the market, which is right. crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which yeah. is why I do, you know, I, 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 I'm on this entrepreneurial journal journey. Yeah, and presumably that's where Zero Shot Bot comes comes from, and, and we'll 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 get to that in a moment, and we'll definitely yeah. get into the 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 situation with neural networks and and the kind of advancements that's showing. I think that'd be definitely a nice avenue to go down. Sure, uh, quick sure, sure. quick shout out to uh, Paul Kutzinger, uh, Amazon. He says, "Hey, party people! Hello, Paul. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we've got some discussion discussion happening between Gordon Mullen and Miguel Costa, who." Uh, asking questions around uh in some cases screens may be a hack uh in other yeah. cases maybe it might be more efficient or quicker can you imagine using voice for everything in an office environment uh and we've got some analogies <laughs> yeah. from gordon <laughs> coming around it, ha it happened Indeed. on star trek and it yeah. did uh but i think that you know obviously there's horses for courses and places for for certain things and i think that the way i look at it is a little bit like people used to take um some people never used to like getting their photo taken and they would just shy away from cameras. And then before you know it, people are quite happy taking photos and being in photos and having those photos shared online. And before you know where you are, if any of you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see that I just walk around the street with a camera in my face, walking the dog, chatting rubbish to cameras. And people are in the space now where they're so comfortable that they can take photos of themselves in public and no one thinks anything of it. And so I think the half of this thing is around what are we comfortable with today versus what we'll be comfortable with in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. And still, natural language doesn't necessarily mean speech all the time. It can also mean type and things like that. But yeah, um, yeah. by the way, I, I love. Let me just pick up. I love Gordon's Gordon's comment. Like, uh, so you're absolutely right. Um, it's it, and this is very interesting. Like, you touch on something very interesting. There, there are to some degree uh, these limitations to what we biologically evolve. And indeed, to even take your point further, I would say we're seeing cases where people prefer to use the hack than language. For instance, you, it's commonly, like you said, that teenagers don't want to call each other anymore. They'd much <laughs> rather text each other, right? So what's going on there? Uh, and, and I think that that's a very interesting point. And you're right, context or the situation or the use case or what you want to achieve matters greatly you know sometimes it's much easier to swipe or, or tap than it would be to hey have utter something aloud which may not be suitable for the moment but you know uh, one thing i would say just maybe to add another dimension to it is you know, when you think about even the the folks who text right um you don't often see folks texting incredibly long deep conversations you know what i mean mm. or you know, th there's places where um, some of these interfaces fail when you want to get to uh, certain levels of ease. Um, but I think it's a very interesting uh, point to make. There is a space for these other interfaces. Um, but there's, there's also a space where these other ways of interacting with technology just cannot fill, right? It just can't replace 
um, inter, you know, if you want to interact with, uh, you know, I have students come to my office hours all the time uh, for the courses I teach, and uh, it would be impossible to exchange those conversations, you know, which often, hopefully, most of the time are very intelligent conversations <laughs> um, uh, with like a means like texting. But, but I think that was a really interesting uh, point to, to add some color to that, uh, uh, to mm. that thought, right? That's mm. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, but again, that that means that that you know those observations are such that maybe we're early in the adoption. And you referenced earlier on that we're kind of primitive in terms of our kind of approach. And you're talking about things like neural nets, and we're capable of much more and all this kind of stuff. I was talking to somebody yesterday who, who, uh, and I've heard this analogy used many, many times before, and used similar ones myself, which is around how where we are as far as our kind of um, usage, advancement, application, however you want to phrase it, of AI in, in the conversational cool. setting is a little bit like the old days of the web where it was just HTML tables and a couple of hyperlinks and that was pretty mm-hmm. much all you had. Mm-hmm. It, would, you, would you concur with that? And if so, in what respect? Like when you're talking about those primitive examples, what mm-hmm. specifically examples are, are you referring to? Yeah, so it's it's a very interesting phenomenon, and I've been thinking about this uh, a good bit. Um, like, why is it that we've got thousands of chatbot companies? You know, all of the four big companies in the world. You know, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, uh, Google, mm-hmm. <laughs> Google. Like, they're all investing incredibly heavily on conversational AI technologies, but they all seem similarly poopy. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're similarly broken and there's a stagnation there. Like, why is that? Um, especially as the science is, is just screaming forward and there's incredible achievement happening uh, in the academic papers, if you read them, right? And so, so when you look at it though, um, there are these things and you're, I think the HTML example is, is apt because it, it kind of touches on, you, you have these, practices that em- that evolve and it becomes the the standard practice as to how you build a chatbot system or or a, a set of techniques that are assumed as the design principles for said thing and those those principles as to how you build this technology is is kept from from you know from generation to generation and built upon incrementally right so mm-hmm. so they'll take this core approach And then they'll just layer some features on top to a core that fundamentally works a certain way. So just to be concrete for the folks who know about chatbot building systems, this intent entity dichotomy, right? So so, uh, conversationally, I system chatbot building systems uh, really sit on, well, three pieces, intent, classification, detecting what the intent is as a bucket of what the user is talking about, Entity extraction, which is let me pluck out the variables, let me pluck out the parameters in that utterance now that I know what intent it has. And then there's dialogue management, which is, well, where should the conversation go next, right? So there's these three pillars and, and everyone's kind of working in that design framework mm-hmm. to create conversational AI solutions. And it's not clear that that's the only, it's, it's certainly clear that our brains do not work that way, that our <laughs> neurons don't work that way. You know that. And it's also not clear that there aren't other ways you can recast the entire problem to attack it differently. And so I think that you see this very diminishing returns progress that feels like stagnation because there's this assumed framework as to how you build these things. And so, and everybody's following that framework, like Mm. all the big four, the systems they provide follow this kind of framework. And and then every chatbot company follows that framework and we're in this um, free market, right? And so in the free market, whenever you come out with something new, you have to say, we have all the, all the features everybody else has and then we added these two differentiating features. <laughs> and, so, and so you get, you get into this situation where everyone's doing this, I call it the scri- skyscraper problem. Everybody's trying to build a skyscraper just a little higher than each other. Mm-hmm. And all the skyscrapers are far away from the ultimate goal. Mm. And so I think that explains the stagnation. Now, the cool thing is there's also all kinds of problems with why it takes so long for things to come out of research into product in mm. industry. 
that's broken. I can go on about that, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think that now is the time for real interesting innovation. If we were to step back, the folks who know how to really build and approach these systems, step back and rethink the entire thing. Mm. Um, and GPT-3 is an interesting uh, point in that space. That mm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That, that 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 makes total sense, and that's that exactly mirrors my reflection of where we're at. And the the, mm. the conversations that we've been having lately on on VOX World has been with companies like Hiro, who who are moving oh. away from an intent based NLU, mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. Vlooper, who also mm -hmm. don't have an intent based NLU, mm -hmm. and diving into those kind of problems. And also with with, with companies like Open Dialogue, or, although mm -hmm. although they work with intent based NLUs, their design approach is different. And the thing that, that we've been thinking and talking about lately is exactly how you, you've just summarized it better than I ever could, which is that there almost seems to be this status quo that exists around intent-based NLUs and how you approach designing them and the flow charts that get built when you build a chatbot. And, not, and all of that seems to be taken for granted, taken as read, and that's just the way that it is. And it almost feels like... It's nice and it's, it, it shouldn't be refreshing, but it's refreshing when you hear about companies like Zero Shot Bot and Vlooper and Hyro and, and similar who are just not accepting that that's the way it is and not accepting those limitations. Right. And, and I think those are the folks to watch, right? Like, you know, you'll see all these acquisitions going on and they're just, they're one company that's doing it the same way, acquiring another company that's doing it the same way with two extra features. But <laughs> the companies to watch are the companies who are challenging the uh, status quo, challenging the established approach that everybody thinks is a law or a rule, mm, mm. Uh, breaking rules to, to build something different and something potentially interesting. And, and if these companies also kind of have, have a good background to do that kind of work, then that, that's, what, that's what the market should be watching for. Because I'll tell you this, when it comes to the breakthrough moment, that the breakthrough moment for conversational AI is going to happen, I think, in, in, in one of those places. So I, mm. if I was a VC, that's what I'd be looking for. I'd be looking for folks who, who come with a narrative that, oh, yeah, we, we break the mold on fundamentally how conversational AI systems are built. Mm. And this is how. And then you mm. look at the how, and then you look at the performance of the how and what it can do, what the implications of that how is. Uh, and then you'll know whether it's, 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 it's something very interesting. You know? mm, mm. And so some of that how it sounds, sounds like you're quite a fan of the likes of GPT-3 and, and neural networks yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Is that where you think the how is going to come from? And if so, what is it specifically about yeah. your likes of GPT-3 that is different to, to what's out there at the moment? Yeah. Well, you see, GPT-3 is a very interesting, oh man, I don't know if there's a thing, but it's, a, it's like almost a socio-computer scientific <laughs> development. It's almost like sociolo sociological in terms of how, how you can appreciate what it means. So for folks who aren't fully aware, um, GPT-3 is this model created by OpenAI. OpenAI started with Elon Musk, Musk's crazy investment. I think it was a billion dollars, some crazy amount to uh, create the team of the most high powered thinkers in, in machine learning to just create solutions and advancement for the world's benefit. Of course, after GPT-3, uh, Microsoft was inspired to license the tech for billions of dollars, for a billion dollars, uh, <laughs> by and large inspired by GPT-3's performance uh, to then you know, be able to commercialize things. But um, GPT-3 is this, it's a neural network model. It's one of these transformer model based models um, that is trained on the entire, you can think of it as the entire internet so all of the internet trains this model as a simplification. Mm -hmm. uh, and this model is one of the first to demonstrate incredible feats when it comes to something called zero shot learning. So the, the, the paper for this thing, it came out in 2020. Uh, so just a year old, really uh, catapulted this, this, this thought of zero shot learning into the minds of many thinkers. Uh, and so there's zero shot, few shot, and uh, zero shot, one shot, and few shot learning. What it means is you train this model generally on the world. So it, just as a simplification, you let this model learn from the entire internet. And then all of a sudden you have a model where you can give it challenges, new tasks, different things to do. 
and it performs incredibly well. So for instance, this model read the internet and all of a sudden you could say, okay, well, I want you to build a web page for me. And the web page should look like this, have this to the left, have that to the right and do this, put a button over here, put a button over there. And then the model can build that website, the HTML, generate that HTML code for you. Mm. Or you can say, you know, I'm really feeling like listening to like a song that's sad. And, you know, I want to know like four chords that it, I should have in sequence to give me a nice ballad style rock song that's sad. And then the GPT-3 will write that, write those <laughs> chords for you. And it goes on and on. It can do incredible things because it learned generally from the internet. It can be applied to new things without training. That's the key thing. So you don't have to train it to do the chord progression construction. You don't have to train it to build websites. It can just do it because it read the internet once and it requires zero training. That's a zero shot learned uh, capability. Mm. And so to me, and let, let me say this, to me, I believe that, that, that the introduction of that concept and the demonstration of something interesting from almost a sociological standpoint in technology from that concept is the key to revolutionizing the, mark, the commercial world with AI. There's almost been this weird narrative that AI is gonna change everything, but like no one's seeing everything change. Mm. And I believe the blocker to that is for businesses and creators to leverage AI to do interesting things. It requires this almost barrier to entry of understanding how to train these things. How do you collect the data just right? How do you clean mm. the data just right? If you wanna add a new feature, how do you change all of your data over again, just right and train the model. And this ends up in practice for building chatbots. I've learned it takes 12 to 18 months to go through. And if you get it a little wrong, the result is, is poopy. That's why a lot of chatbots are terrible. They're just not poorly trained. And so that's the barrier. That's a hard piece. And so people try to hire data science scientists. This is where the whole data scientists need came from because they're like, we don't know how to take data and do cool stuff. And there's, <laughs> And then the data scientists are actually often not, they don't have the answers necessarily. Uh, you might need a, a machine learning PhD to like help you, but those aren't very available. So this has been the viscosity of progress in the market, right? A source of viscosity. So that's why we're not mm -hmm. seeing it. But with zero shot learning, you can have your crazy ML scientists train something once and then you can utilize it across many use cases without having to train it. Uh, and I, so I think that is a key to revolutionizing uh, the market. Mm. So, mm. yeah. Interesting. So, so you've, got what, you've got zero shot learning, which is the, the ability to not need to train something based on it ingesting uh, the whole internet, basically. Then you, you mentioned you got one shot and few shot. Presumably that means then that one shot is you give it one training example, few shot means you give it a handful or something. Yeah, a handful, three to five. You know. Yeah, okay. And, and, and is that what, is that essentially the essence of Zero Shot Bot, the, the company yes. operating, is, is to try right. and provide this capability in a more accessible way? Yeah, no, ab so, so absolutely. So it's inspired by that concept. You do not have to train this bot on new capabilities. So you want the bot to be an expert in subject area A, no training required, it can perform subject area A. You want it to be able to do subject area B, no training required. You wanna expand the bot to do more subject areas, no training required. So that's the under, that's the core principle of the zero shot bot concept. Now it's not using GPT-3. There's a swath of companies out there that is hooking into GPT-3's API to leverage that particular model uh, to create these kinds of solutions like web page creation or marketing materials generation and, and stuff mm. like that. Uh, so we, we use our own in-house model to build Zero Shot Bot to have the cap capacity to do this, this kind of uh, zero training bot creation, bot expansion of capabilities, et cetera. And some of the some of the the nice thing about it is you can build a chatbot in like two days without training it launch it and then it's really good it's it's production grade really good and solves mm -hmm. your problems and so like we have one customer uh alternate e-source that we did just this like, in a week 
we built a we built a bot and had it deployed on website in a week. And it is a sensor network, uh, a U.S. company sensor network mm. uh, solutions. Um, and 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 then the second week after that, they were able to sell product without human touch, without any kind of human interaction. They just sold stuff. You know, <laughs> people came on the platform, just used the bot, and it was an info bot. Um, and and I call what I call info bot. So it's a it's a bot where you you learn about something. You, you can learn to onboard onto a product. You can learn about what the product features are. You can, you really, it's an information interaction. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to interact with this bot, learn all about the product and then purchase it. And a week after launching it, which took a week, it was like two days to build, a couple days to go through approval processes, get it on a website. A week later, they made a sale. Those folks are crazy. Um, <laughs> and this is pre-launch, right? They're just one of our early access uh, 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 customers. Um, so it's incredibly promising for businesses and small businesses too, right? Um, one of the big things they talk about is, oh my gosh, you know, my colleague was looking at our website, saw the chatbot there, and they're like, we had no idea you were big enough to have a chatbot. <laughs> so there's this kind of thing where you have to be a big company. There's this thing in the market where you have to be a big company to have a chatbot. And we make it trivially easy and it's super cheap, uh, you know, SaaS thing. You know, it's like G Suite or something, it's a, couple <laughs> a couple dollars a month and you're good because <laughs> it's so easy, right? Uh, and so they had it up quick and then folks were like, and I love that. I love that we're democratizing who gets to have this kind of technology. It's not just your Verizons and your, your Bank of Americas and these folks. Uh, it could be the, the little technology company that builds sensor networks and sells it you know, mm, to mm. folks who have niche use cases and, and uh, they, can, they can have a chatbot that helps them create value for the customers too. So, so I'm really excited about this thing uh, and it's launching in November. It's launching November 10th to the world um, mm. and everything is getting relaunched, website, product, oh, everything, open access, whatever. <laughs> um, and and that, that democratizing uh, promise of zero shot learned tech is, mm. an, is another demonstration of uh, this thesis that um, zero shot learning is going to be the way we actually see AI transform uh, our markets. Mm. So that, that's definitely that's definitely admirable in terms of the the, the democratization of, of these technologies because that is ultimately what will um, that's where the value is. If you can if you can democratize this and reach that long tail of companies, the millions and millions and millions of companies that don't have one hundred and fifty thousand pounds to do a proof of concept, mm -hmm. then inevitably that's gonna that's, that's a good thing. I'm curious around around how that like let's say that I am a small florist or something like that. There must be exactly. an element of training, though, because how does how does how does how right. does your language model have any idea about the flowers that I sell and right. the the all of that kind of stuff? There must be some degree. Of, you must you must need some data. Yeah. From yes, thing. exactly. So there's data involved. The data is not used to train, though. So so the, the the data involved is you you've got to have all the answers, right? Mm -hmm. So. You just put in all the answers, just put in the information about your flower shop and the kind of flowers you have and whatever, like how, where they grow, what kind of temperatures they need. I don't know, what, <laughs> I don't know much about flowers. So you put your information. <laughs> Neither do I. I don't know why. I don't know why we got onto this example, yeah. but let's yeah. go with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's a good one, right? You put your information in and uh, that's it. Uh, and so you just enter, you enter in answers and then the bot doesn't have to be trained how to understand people. So currently with the intent entity extraction dialogue management way, you have to train those intents. So you have to give examples of what people will say to the system. And that's the, that in there lies the mired pitfalls situation, mm. right? Um, because then you have to give it examples of what people might say to the bot so it can learn from those examples and then be able to perform. There's none of that. All you do is you give it the, the responses that it should be capable of saying, and then that's it. So literally, you know, when I demo this, this thing, uh, in five minutes, I put in like 15 responses and then launch. Mm. It's like 15 responses and no training button to do. You do 15 responses and hit launch. And then you launch it and then you can start talking to it. And then it's fully knowledgeable about those 15 responses and can understand you with great accuracy, what you're asking for. And so, 
So that's the, so as opposed to a typical process where the responses that you give is like the last thing people build. Typically when they build chatbots with this intent-based approach, it's like you train it to understand, you, you put in some stub responses, right? And you train it to understand, you get these big data sets of, here's all the questions that you might hear. And this is like 10 different ways people might frame the same question. And then the data has got to be clean. You do all this work for 12 to 18 months, and then you can spend like what, a week making sure your responses are good because the responses aren't used in the AI at all, right? You, so yeah. you start with the intent to train it and then, then the response is whatever, like assuming the intent has got everything right and your entity has got extracted right, then you just have, then whatever, it'll, it'll work. But this is complete, we cut out that entire training piece, that intent piece, that entity piece, Mm -hmm. And we just say, give us the responses and we will be good at talking to your customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you start with the responses and then you, you, you automatically get a buy, right? So mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, and the responses are easy, right? I mean, you know, my typical demo is I'll go to McDonald's uh, FAQ page. I'll go to mm -hmm. McDonald's page. They have all the answers. I'll just <laughs> cut answers and stick it in the, stick it in the bot. And then I hit launch and then people talk to the bot and it's, it's, it's stupid good, right? <laughs> you know, you can say some stuff like, oh, I got a gluten issue. What could I eat? You know, mm. or, or yeah, or, or I got, no, no, I got celiac disease. Like, what can I eat? And then it's like, we have X gluten options, blah, 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 blah. And in it, there's no place where it talks about celiac disease. It just right. knows that that question about your celiac disease corresponds to this gluten relevant response and it was never trained explicitly to do that for your answers right mm -hmm. so so it's um yeah it's it, it's very easy we call it our, our little tagline is easy peasy the easy peasy <laughs> chatbot right? yeah. that's class uh, so we've got we've, we've had some questions coming through and apologies everyone awesome. i know there's been some activity on the chat and i can't always keep up with all of it but there's two specific ones that have definitely been uh that have been asked which i think will be definitely good to get into so one was uh from paul Kutzinger. Uh, so wanting to dive a little bit deeper into this whole concept of no training and how you then, uh, how you train, how, how you cater for specific domain specific terminology. So let's say for example, that, you know, let's use banking. Cause I know that you're familiar through, through Clink with the banking industry and whatnot. <laughs> Banks have very specific product types. They have very specific jargon around a lot of their services. Um, how would in a use case like that, where there is specific jargon, specific terminology, very specific domain specific information. How does this whole no training concept work in, in that presumably new environment for the, for the NLU? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I'll do a quick response to Kane. Yes, it works with, with voice. You can, you can attach that voice piece no. through an API. So that, that's yeah, quick. That but to, to the question, well, how do you deal with jargon? Well, it turns out that out of the box, it, it works incredibly well in certain jargon uh, use cases. For instance, that alternate e-source e uh, the you know, company I'm talking about is actually heavily jargon, like some of the jargon I don't even understand. <laughs> so it works out of the box. The model is really, really good, right? Because it was trained. It doesn't just use individual words to figure out what's going on. It'll use the entire utterance uh, and it can, it can reason about that utterance uh, and what is likely the best response to provide to the user based on the whole utterance. So an individual world word that's jargony doesn't break it. For per se. That being mm -hmm. said, uh, and we have a patent uh, on this. It's a patents filed, um, and it's uh, provisional and so forth. It's going through the process, but we've added a number of uh, techniques in the platform to uh, to tweak the bot's performance. So one of the one of the things is <clears throat> when you're building a chatbot and you say you put the answers in and you launch it, you might want to tweak something, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have these mechanisms that allows you to uh, tweak the bot. So there's something we call zero shot linking, right? Where you can just do these little links, which are hints to the bot as to, to change a, to change a particular response behavior. And then that hint will kind of matriculate or, or, or percolate through the entire system and improve it automatically. And so, so we have that. So if, if there's, if there's a misfire based on jargon, you can use this zero shot linking capability and then you'll improve the bot to understand jargon. We also have something that is, we call anchor answers versus 
So there's the anchor answers versus display answers. So you get some freedom to change the, the and this is, ends up being useful for this tweaking activity to change um, what, the, what the bot's thinking about to, to, to separate that from what it actually will say, right? So it's almost yeah. like you want the bot to pay attention to these answers, but you want to add all kinds of jargon and emojis and whatever else in what's displayed, but you don't want to confuse the bot with all your emojis and so forth <laughs> or any extra superfluous information. <clears throat> that has nothing to do with the answer or, or not, the core answer that you want to provide. And so that, that gives you another really nice landscape to kind of tweak so that you can improve the bot as you go and learn. Um, so we have these improvement methods, but it's not training, right? It's, it's, it's different kinds of nudges. And these nudges, can, can you're poking the model to go in one direction or the other. And these methods are so intuitive that it's, it's just completely... Like you don't, you, you can't really mess up your bot with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is one of the big challenges. You see the thing, the funny thing about the intent based approach is that, and I, I have a piece on this. I, I was, I was going to publish it, but I don't know why we're holding it. We're holding it from Roger or something, whatever. It's, a, <laughs> it's kind of an academic, not academic, but it's, it's kind of an intellectual piece where I talk about why it's impossible to scale bots building the intent framework. Mm. And that is, as you grow the number of intents, you have to redesign your entire data set for all the existing intents. So let's say you have 100 intents and you want to add the 101 intent. Mm. When you want to add that one intent, you're not just working on that one intent to add it. You also have to review the data used to train all your other 100 intents so you don't have conflicts, you don't introduce noise to the model mm. where you have similar kinds of utterances and multiple data sets. Now this creates an exponentially growing amount of work because every time you add one thing, you've got more stuff to then do all of the work with, and it just becomes untenable at a certain scale. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that's, this is one of the, this is one of the key, key things about a, a different approach, right? When you add another answer, you don't have to do anything. Uh, and it, it, it performs, it performs well, but mm. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, it sounds as though Miguel is keen. When can, when can we test it? He said, did you say November? November 10th is November the 10th. launch date. Okay. We'll see if it ends up being 13th. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Cause uh, we got, uh, there's a bunch of stuff going on, but you know, honestly, Miguel, I got to tell you, if you, if you shoot me an email, I'll give you access today. <laughs> Seriously. And the thing is, it's it, you onboard yourself. It's completely self-serve. I'll give you access today. Okay. I, 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 this is the that deal. I'll give you access today. And here's the deal. 20 minutes into your experience, if you're like, holy crap, I have a really amazing bot and I don't know what the hell just happened. If you feel <laughs> like that, you got to give us a quote to use for lunch. That sounds good. That sounds good. Well, Miguel, if you want to take Jason up on that offer, I would definitely recommend that you reach out to him and do that because that sounds uh, mm -hmm. that sounds amazing. Uh, he's got some some very uh, uh, that's a very big smiley heart filled emoji that he's, uh, that he's put in there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, awesome. That's that's cool. That's cool. Uh, we'll we'll pass you on uh, Jason's email, uh, Miguel. Um, at the end of the at the end of the thing, I'm sure I'm sure Jason. Will, I don't know if he wants to share it publicly or whether we'll do that behind the scenes but but we will get that email um so this this all sounds very good obviously and it's solving some in, inherent problems with that intent based approach as we've kind of got to and it's it's one training data is one thing but then also the other part of, of the dialogue management is another which is when you have 100 intents mm -hmm. you have very complex conversations and then you want to change a piece of that conversation to maybe add an extra turn or clarify some mm -hmm. information and then you add a new intent yes you've got all that training palaver to sort out but then you've also got how does that then affect the rest of the conversation and the twists and turns that it has and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff mm -hmm. um and so i can totally understand how this intentless approach this zero shot approach helps when it comes to things like um getting answers to common questions that like mcdonald's faq example absolutely perfect you know um things like you know i don't know let's say insurance policy questions you know retail refund requirements all, all product information definitely i can see how in that kind of like 
first stage of the customer journey, discovering, yeah, 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 yeah. researching, comparing, mm-hmm. deciding. I can see right. how all of that stuff is infinitely improved. Right. What What about when it gets to things that require um, require things to happen, like I want to buy something through the chatbot or I want to totally. actually <clears throat> register a return through the chatbot. Yeah. Now we're into, we're, we've got system integrations happening. We've got very mm-hmm. specific bits of information that we need to gather that regardless of whether you're using tents or not, we need to know mm-hmm. what your order number was or whatever it right. might be. Right. How, how do you right. approach that kind of like yeah. more transactional side of things? Or are, are you purely yeah, yeah, focusing yeah, yeah, on yeah. the information at the moment? Yes. Oh, beautiful. Great question. So the quick answer is, uh, and this is this piece is so I, there's two kinds of bots that you know I just kind of I like I, I wrote this piece it's a long treatise to to create these two this taxonomy taxonomy of of conversational AI and there's two in this taxonomy there's two kinds of conversation there's what I call info bots which are information disbursement bots mm-hmm. and then there's what I call auto bots which is what you're talking about mm-hmm. and that's a uh, uh, process automation bots, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a process and you want to automate the interactions along that process to complete the process with conversational AI. Zero shot bot is squarely focused on info bots right now. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. the cool thing about this piece is that most of the bots that we have in our world, think about it. Most of the chat bots that are out there are actually info bots built with auto bot tech. <laughs> and the problem is Autobot tech is not the right bot for scaling the amount of information you can handle because of that intent thing. So this piece goes into it in great detail. But to your question, um, so we focus entirely on infobots. And the use cases that I'm excited about is, of course, there's the customer service, answer common questions. Uh, there's, you know, learn about products, uh, all of that. But there's also things like product onboarding. So, so which is, there's there's all these digital products and people need help. And, you know, you, you have this broken help system where you go and maybe there's a forum you could search or like a help archive a documentation you could search to get your answer mm. broken. Having a conversational AI that can walk you through step by step all your weird little intricate questions along the journey of using a new product uh, digitally is, is, a, is another use case that's an infobot use case. Uh, mm-hmm. So... So it turns out, and it, when you look at the market, when it comes to that Autobot space, the process automation bot, which is filing a claim, mm. uh, you know, uh, some of the examples you use, right? Like taking you through a journey. There's mm. very few of those. And ZeroShot Bot, as it stands today, is not ideal for those use cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, that's on our roadmap. Mm. But the thing is, the promise we're making is that we're going to give you a zero shot capability of achieving those kinds of conversational AI. And we actually already have the R&D going for techniques, zero shot techniques for looking at some interactions and then generating a chatbot with no training, right? So, mm. so, so, you know, so, so that's that Autobot space, we separate it where it's, you want to run a user through a process, like opening up a, a mortgage application or mm. going through a mortgage application. Mm. Zero shot bot isn't ideal for that, but zero shot bot is ideal for HR, right? Like mm. you know, people have all kinds of info questions in mm. HR. Mm. You've got all the products in, in the world. You want to learn about it before you buy it. You might have weird, interesting, intricate questions to learn about products. You might want to onboard onto the product with a chat bot uh, so that you don't have to look at documentation. So mm. that's the kind of realm that Zero Shot Bot is, is laser focused on. Mm, um, that makes sense. But that being said, we actually do have capabilities for uh, you know, kind of multi-turn interactions, mm. but, but that is, it, it's, not, it's not designed with the use case in mind of fully like filling out a, a mortgage application. You might yeah. have to wait for the next version the next, <laughs> yeah, you <know>? yeah. well <laughs> you, you, you need to choose a problem to solve uh, to, exactly. to start you know um exactly. and i think that i think that it sounds it sounds definitely as though this is this is a, an ideal place to start because you know you've got organizations that are um they are information rich it's just that most of the time it's poorly organized isn't it and, and mm-hmm. most of the most of any organization's contact with uh a, a, a end user is predominantly the end user trying to work their way through the organization mm-hmm. levels 
to get to either someone or something that has the information. That could be scrolling through pages and pages of websites. It could be making phone calls or sending emails that get passed on and passed on to. So it's basically a user is always on this little search throughout the organization to find the information. Exactly. It could, could exactly. be product features, could be policy details, whatever it might be. Yeah. And I think what, what this allows is that all of, for all of that organizational information to be fed up to oh. the AI so that that's the thing that can then disseminate it rather than a customer being forced to go down the depths of the organization right. to find stuff. Right. It's right. like the AI can do that exactly. and the user just goes there and everything's there and ready as far as, uh, as far as the answers to questions and stuff. Are exactly. And it's conversational, right? It's, mm. it's, it's, uh, you're, you're just using conversational means to get to exactly natural means to get exactly to the information you want. Mm. So, yeah. Do, do you see that? Um, cause part of the problem with that is that, um, organizations, if you think about the, I know we've been talking about smaller organizations that will find value from this, but obviously the larger organizations arguably would find more value from it because they've got more services, more products, more customers, more scope. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you would envision when it comes to using something like zero shot bot aside from 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 what you have done in terms of the technology and how that works i, I don't envisage you're going to be pointing holes in that side of things but in terms of from the organization's perspective some companies have data that's wrapped up in pdfs and word documents yeah. that need specific yeah, yeah. people to look at it some people have policy pages that are written in so much jargon that you can't even read or comprehend right. half of it right. so so right. some organizations have terrible data basically exactly it, Exactly. What is, is that a problem or what other challenges yeah, do you envisage actually, people having when they want to try and use something? The biggest challenge I think folks will have is related to exactly, you know, you're so good at this, probably because you know everything <laughs> about conversation. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> but you're right on. That's actually the biggest challenge. So a lot of folks will have, you see, to create a conversational AI, you can't just lift sections out of, you know, like messy documentation because it doesn't, you can't, you can't just extract stuff and give it to a user in a conversation. It just isn't natural. It doesn't feel like you're talking to an intelligent human being. So there's this step where you, you want to make sure that your, your, your bot is conversational and how it responds to answers. And so there is, it's, the data needs to end up looking different. So we, of course, we have import capabilities where we could import copious amounts of, you know, existing data so you can have that but there's a step uh and it really comes with the, what you display to the user when they're asking questions because you don't want to display mm. that cruddy i gotta tell you it's <laughs> you don't want to display that those cruddy responses you don't need a response that's like 400 words for instance mm. some of the answers like if you read an faq online or something you'll get like these paragraphs and paragraphs of answers and you can't serve that up in a chat bot <laughs> people just want a quick human-like response and so there's so sometimes, depending on the, the situation, sometimes there's a process that needs to go through to make sure that those answers are reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. For a conversational AI. So that's one thing. Um, and the, the, other, the other challenge is um, a lot of user, a lot of, a lot of the stuff people info that they have about their product or whatever it is, or their HR processes or whatever it is they're building the bot around, has nothing to do with what people really want to ask. <laughs> so they'll put a bunch of info in the bot and then they'll be like, yeah, this is good. This is all the stuff we want people to know about. <laughs> but then people ask completely different questions about other stuff. And so if you don't have those answers, um, then the, the bot won't be able to serve those up, right? And so, so, what, so it's a process. And I think it is very well recognized. Uh, you know, mm. um, sh shout out to Raza, because Raza has a very, elegant way of uh, describing this process. They call it um, CDD or something, conversational driven. Uh, com com yeah, conversation driven design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Conversation driven yeah. design. Yeah. Very yeah. Elegant Deve way development, development I think it is. I think you're right with development. Yeah, yeah, development. Like it's a very elegant way to cast it. It's you know, kind of based on the TDD, which is testing driven development. But, but uh, basically once you launch that bot or, or you run some process, there's a number of processes you could run to find out really what is it that people want to ask. Sometimes the organization will know because they have logs of their customer interactions and they can just see what the customers are asking from those logs from like live, live agents or something. But uh, you know, often folks will have to discover this. And so 
usually the beautiful thing about Zia Shabbat is, and this kind of approach to chatbot creation is, you can launch your bot with what you think people want, the information they need, then see that they ask other questions like, you know, like, what's your address? I, I, I don't know, like, you may mm. not have even considered. Mm. And then you can learn from that data. So, so you can see what your user are actually asking to figure out what info the bot needs to have. And mm. so I think that that's one of the processes that's, that's often uh, new. Uh, we were working with this, um, it's a, I'm not going to give away any names, but it's a, it's a sheet music company that had like massive amounts of data. And so they, they, you just cram all the data into the, the bot. And then users were asking things completely different. Like, you know, what was Bach's third movement or something? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, Beethoven's, uh, there's a fifth sy symphony. Is there a sixth symphony for Beethoven? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> there probably is actually. I don't know. But, um, uh, <laughs> but like, you know, when, when you can't anticipate what people really want to ask, then that, that, be, that, that creates another uh, a rev of the process where you then change the info that's in the bot. So I think mm -hmm. those are the two interesting, two yeah. interesting things, you know. That makes sense. What what is it you mentioned earlier on that a lot of stuff that's happening in, in academia takes too long to get out into the real world and stuff like that. And and obviously when you've got large organizations um that have, that have basically built uh, big businesses basically on top of of the technology that they currently have, it's not just I don't think that um I don't think that maybe there's an unwillingness to adopt certain new technologies or certain new approaches i think that a lot of it is down to the level of risk that it would take to incorporate that into something that's already stable and being used that scale so i think there's obviously reasons for it but and maybe, maybe that could be totally wrong though but what are some of those kind of examples of things that you can see through the academia world sort of like coming down the pipe that you are kind of more excited about yeah 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 so there's something this is interesting because i actually don't think academics are thinking about this enough um there's, <laughs> well, I know I'm working on it. I'm working on something big, I think. Uh, but um, so, so we talked about zero shot learning. So I think people are gonna, they're catching on to this. At least the best, some of the thinkers are catching on to this. And I think the rest of the market will, this is gonna uh, down, you know, uh, ripple effects uh, through mm. the entire market uh, soon, uh, mm. next three to five years. But there is a kind of machine learning uh, framework for training models, approach for training models, that uh, it's called generative adversarial networks, mm -hmm. GANs. And the, the, the big thing about language models, the reason why we're having such a surge in NLP activity is because there was this slight uh, discovery, uh, not discovery, demonstration, I say, in, in academia that you can have an unsupervised learning approach applied to language models. So this is just a model that will learn, a, like learn the intricacies of language automatically. You could think of it by reading Wikipedia or reading mm. news articles or reading the internet. So you can train models this way and then they're really smart and you can quickly get them to do perform really well at some of the grand challenges. And it's an unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning uh, training technique. Now there's another one. And that's, that's possible. And it's, it's, it's created a big splash in the computer vision realm. So you can, in an unsupervised way, train a model to generate realistic looking human faces with GANs. Somebody should search this. It's these people do not exist.com. Just search that, go there, and you'll see faces that were drawn by a machine pixel by pixel without, it's just completely fabricated. <laughs> And it's because it learned through this unsupervised means called GANs. Now, there was a very interesting paper in 2020 from Google called Electra. And it, it, was, a, it was a, Electra is actually one of these models, right? It, it's trained using a GAN-like approach, right? Which is an adversarial network, unsupervised training approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and people could search this stuff if you want to. It's fascinating. And so... But it, it was like, it's, it's, it hasn't created a massive splat, but everybody's not talking about GANs as applied to NLP yet. But I think that when you look at something like GPT-3, right? GPT-3 took $4.6 million to train one time, mm. right? 
OpenAI have the resources. Thank you, Elon Musk, for funding that thing. <laughs> Training it one time is $4.6 million because it's so much data, so much compute. You know, you have to burn up a whole nuclear power plant, launch it to run the compute to train this thing. GANs have the capacity, have been dem has, has demonstrated the potential to potentially train these things, much smaller models, something that can fit in smaller space. So you don't have to have a whole cluster to run GPT-3. You might be able to have just a, you know, a machine. Uh, wow. And then it can perform as well as GPT-3 with a tenth or a hundredth of the, the training. So there's another unsupervised framework for training these models that the popular models people are using like BERT and you know, T5 or whatever they're using. There's like 16 BERTs, Alberta, Roberta, <laughs> Distill BERT. There's an Ernie now, there's an Ernie. Yes, there's an Ernie. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so people are still kind of on that. But, but applying this new kind of unsupervised uh, training approach of GANs uh, that came from Vision into NLP, I think there's a massive opportunity there. And, that further democratizes your GPT-3. Because right now, GPT-3 cannot be reproduced by not by a non-Google, pretty much. Mm. Because you have to have millions of dollars to train it once, and guess what? Training is a trip, because if you train things wrong and it doesn't work well, that's $4 million for a broken <laughs> idea. It's like, oh, I thought it would work better, but it actually is 10 times worse. And now it's $4.6 million to so, like, discover that. Like, you can't do this research, you can't do this work as a company, as a small company. But GANs mm. might be able to help democratize, but because of the rate at which it packs knowledge into these uh, neural network architectures, they might have. Anyway, so I'm, I can talk about that alone mm. for an hour and a half <laughs> because I think it's a big deal. I talk about it with my conversational AI class sometimes. Um, I think it's a big deal, and I'm not hearing like a bunch of people talking about it at all. Like mm. there's just a spattering of a research paper here, a research paper there. But it, I think it could be a big deal. So we'll see. I'm working on it, man. Yeah. Interesting. Well, definitely, we will be absolutely glad to have you back to uh, to get into more detail on that and, and follow the thoughts on that. That sounds absolutely immense. Um, I, I want to quickly show, very quickly, if I can, uh, yeah. that website yeah. you was you were talking about. Let me see if it lets me. Uh, let me see if it lets me do this. It's gonna actually. It's only gonna. Well, it's going to share this screen. So on the, on the right hand side, you can see basically the program that I've been running this show through. But on the left hand side, you can see a totally AI generated image. This person does not exist. Dot com. Right, and and let me let me just one say whatever you if you're going to this website and you want to be able to see the tells, it takes a trained eye. But if you look at the earrings, this is the one thing the model often you could it could show its true colors. Ah, uh, here. Sometimes if you look at the earrings, you'll see that the earrings don't exactly match. Yes. And so that's one of the ways you can see that the model, you know, it didn't get it just right, but but look how good it is. Every single pixel in this was rendered by an AI model trying to draw a human face pixel by pixel. Every wow. tooth, every eyelash, everything you see, the eyebrows, the hair, every <laughs> detail in the hair was drawn by a generated from random by a, a machine. That's how... That's the power of GANs. That is unbelievable. For those who are just listening on the podcast, we've just went to thispersondoesnotexist.com and the generated person's face is absolutely staggering. It is literally like better than any avatar I've ever seen and actually genuinely just looks like a photograph. <laughs> it's unreal. <laughs> unreal. Yeah. Well, Jason, this has been absolutely immense. I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, we could have gone for another couple of hours here. It's been absolutely mm -hmm. unbelievable. Um, definitely best of luck with zero shot bot i'll be looking out for the launch and certainly uh doing my part to to share it and spread the word and stuff like that i think it's a really really good approach and it's 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 as i said at the beginning there's there's a almost like a, an acceptance and a status quo within the industry that is very much happy with where we are and is just you 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 know stuck 
essentially. Um, and I don't think that the, some people aren't in a position to change it. Some people are using the tools and working with what they've got, which is fine. And there's still things happening that are exciting in that kind of space and some good stuff being done. But what I love seeing is disruption. And I love seeing things and people that are pushing the board, pushing the boundaries, not accepting where we are and always looking for better. And I think that Zero Shot Bot, from what I've heard, is definitely one of those companies. And you are definitely one of those people. So thank you for spending the time with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure entirely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for everyone tuning in uh, and, and for all of the discussion that was going on. There's been bags and bags of conversations going on. And I have to say this at the end of every episode, which is apologies for not getting around to all of the questions. It's just quite hard to uh, to follow it all sometimes. Um, but I'm sure, uh, I'm hopefully anyway, we got into all sorts of stuff there, Jason. So I'm, sh I'm sure most of that stuff hopefully was answered. Um, and yeah. do not forget, if you are interested, uh, check out our sponsor, Deepgram, deepgram.com forward slash VUX world for uh, your speech recognition needs. And if you're not already subscribed to VUX world, then where have you been all my life? VUX.world forward slash subscribe. Subscribe. Uh, we will be back tomorrow where we'll be talking with Staz Tashinsky of Industry Mic about the future of interactive voice ads. And we've got another, I think, double header next week. We've got two shows next week as well. We're absolutely on fire here. So please do go to vux.world forward slash subscribe. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Jason. And we'll speak very soon.